Lord, we ask that you bless this gathering with your manifest presence. Lord, supply grace to us. Fill us with a meaningful life in this world as we await your glorious return. Fill us with a life full of joyful sanctification, full of meaning and doing your will as we await your glorious return. Thank you, Father in heaven. In Jesus' name we have prayed. Amen. Praise God. Good morning, everybody. How y'all doing? <laughs> Praise God. Okay, so I think today will be the last um, part of this series on Galatians called Sinai and Zion. We've been looking through the book of Galatians. It's been a good time. It's personally been a blessing to me. I would encourage um, everyone who has missed any part of this to please get it because the book was written in one sitting. And so it is best understood and heard also in one, in one breath so that you can really appreciate the depth of the context and everything that you know, um, the Lord's Holy Apostle Paul was saying to the Galatian church and by extension to us. Hallelujah. Praise God. Please permit me to just um, recap a couple of things. Listen to me, my people. Um, no, that, those are signs of a healthy church. Hallelujah. Amen. So, uh-huh. A healthy church is a church where there's bars singing the hymn, there's soprano singing the hymn, and children are crying in the background. Amen. Amen. Praise God. If it's only men you are hearing, there's a problem. And if it's only sisters you are hearing, problem. And if you are not hearing children's voices, ha. So, praise God. Something I would just like to restate, very important. it was very important to Apostle Paul and it also should be very important to us. Listen, the gap between us, between God and us is so wide. I love the scripture that um, Brother Glory, Reverend Glory, shared <laughs> earlier, right? See, God dwells in unapproachable light. No man will ever, no, is it just in such approachable light that no man has ever seen or will ever see. Do you understand that? That means that God is so far greater than us that even when we go to the new heavens and the new earth, what the, when we see God, what we'll see is still a condescension. You understand what that means? God is still condescending to the new heavens and the new earth. Because if God, God was, God is, before the heavens and the earth were created. So that means that even when we get to heaven, which we all used to describe the new heavens and the new earth, when the Lord returns and we see him, the revelation we see is still a condescension. Praise God. And so that means that we cannot do anything to his taste. We cannot achieve his level by our own works. The righteousness that we have, everything that we have is a gift. That thing must sink into your heart. Everything that we have is a what? Let me give you an idea. I just had an idea just a few minutes before, before service. Um, media, please help me. So I asked chat, right? That if you want to describe the distance between, I heard from Tim Keller, so I wanted to get the facts myself. Um, if you want to describe the distance between our planet, planet Earth and the sun, what does it look like? If, it, if the distance between our planet and the sun was one sheet of paper, right? If it was the thickness of one sheet of paper, right? What will the distance between our sun and the next sun, Alpha Centauri, what would it be like? So if this is planet Earth and this is the sun, and to give you perspective, the sun is very far. The sun is so far that light from the sun takes four minutes to get to us. Do you know how fast light travels? The the distance between our earth and the sun is far. Now, if we say that distance is like a sheet of paper, let's try and put it in scales, like a sheet of paper, right? The distance between our sun and the next sun to us, the closest sun to us, is like as if you stack up 363,000 sheets of paper. So you have one sheet of paper describing the difference between our earth and the sun. If you look at the distance between our sun and the next sun, you have to stack 263,000 sheets of paper. That's to show you how far. Now, if we now want to say what is, let's try and have an idea of what the diameter of our galaxy is, right? The Milky Way, right? What is the diameter of our galaxy? By that same scale, it will be 6.2, 6.32 billion sheets of paper. Brothers and sisters, the Hubble telescope recently tried to guess how many galaxies are in our 
um, universe. And before, they were estimating like 2 billion galaxies. Now, based on the data we're getting from cosmic background radiation, and trying to see how far, it, how much time it takes for light to reach our planet since the universe began at the Big Bang at everything. Now, the current estimate of the number of galaxies in our universe is like 2 trillion galaxies. And it's somebody that created everything. The person that created everything is bigger than all these things. The energy inside one star is, I've forgotten how many thousand nuclear um, bombs, warheads. Now look at, we have... <laughs> now there's someone that, there's a way the writer of Hebrews says, the, the, the creator of the house has more honor than the house. So the person that created one son with thousands and thousands of power in terms of nuclear energy, and you now have uncountable sons, all the sons and all the power and all the black holes and all the dark matter in our universe is still not up to the power of our God. What makes you think you can do something to impress him? No, let me say it like this. What makes you think you can do something to earn? What makes you think that you deserve, that you can deserve, that you can get his obligation, that you can do something and the thing will be good enough for him to say, I owe you this. That's like why Paul says, nobody can instruct him. Who has given to the Lord? Who has been his counselor? What do you want to tell him? What do you want to do? That is the reason why we know, and that's why Paul was so emphatic on this. Everything we have in our life is a gift. God will bless you. God will bless you. Not say amen. amen. I love the fact that he, under, he understands the gospel. That even when you are reading your book and you pass an exam, it is the gift of God. How much more our salvation, how much more our righteousness, when God looks at you and says you are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, it's not because you are a good person. God knows how dark your heart is. God knows all your struggles and all your weaknesses. Yet he decides to call you my child and adopted you because you put your trust in him. You realized, you know, he helped you to realize that you cannot help yourself. And you cried out to God and said, God, I cannot help myself. By myself, I will go to hell. Help me. And because you put your trust in him, he imputed righteousness to you and gave you the gift of righteousness. What's that? Okay. No worries. Um, you are practicing for the new earth. So, so in, in the new earth, there will be alligators working with us, lions. The way it was supposed to be in the Garden of Eden, so no panic. It's because it's a broken world that you are panicking for war gecko. Hallelujah. <laughs> Praise God. <laughs> so let's go on. Praise God. I remember when we were in school, there's one pastor that he used to make a joke. I don't know if it was serious or not. He used to say that God did not create mosquitoes. That God created something more beautiful. But the world broke and mosquitoes changed. <laughs> Let's continue. Hallelujah. So, everything that we have is a gift from God. Our righteousness is a gift. We cannot earn it. And so there's, it is completely foolish and even insulting. That's why Apostle Paul used strong words over and over and over and over to describe legalistic people. He says, let them be accursed. He said, what they are preaching is no gospel. Everything they are doing is, is no gospel. He said, let them be accursed. He said, if they want, let them, he said, in fact, they wish to go and castrate themselves. The reason why he was speaking so passionately, because it's almost an insult. To say, I can do something to earn the grace of God. Even the people in the Old Testament, the people that God gave the Lord, they knew that they could not make, they the Lord. Do you understand that? You hear Moses, who shouts, God, you are gracious and merciful. By our own power, who shall stand? David will be telling you that, see, create in me a new heart because your judgment on me is fair. Because I'm a terrible person. As I will say, Lord, if you, if you count righteousness, who will stand? Jeremiah will say it in another way. All of them, they knew. The people go, 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 that own the, the Old Testament. They knew. Go and see Nehemiah's lamentations and Ezra. They will say that even despite the great evil that we did, the punishment you gave us was not up to the punishment we deserve. Nehemiah will say even the punishment you gave us, you, you tried. It was too small compared to what we did. <laughs> These are people that they chased them. They took them into exile. Scattered them. 
And God fulfilled his word and brought them back to Jerusalem. When they came, the people that understood the law, they were still saying, God, you dealt with us, but even the way you dealt with us is still small compared to what we did. So the fact that you can stand in God's presence today and hear his word and he can give you his Holy Spirit is not because you are a good person. It's not because you deserved it. That's why none of us can come into God's presence with shoulders up. You cannot approach anything of God with a sense of entitlement. You can't. Because everything that we have is a gift from God. Church out together. And so this mentality must affect every area of our lives. And it's because God has given us this gift and God has done so much for us that God has been so kind to us that we cannot but love him back. See, he says, neither circumcision nor circumcision avails anything, but faith, working through what? When you put your trust in God and you see what God does, to, does as God, God, God has done for you, the only response that you can have is to love him in return. And that love that you have for him in return is what constrains us I just put so well. That love that we have in return because of what God has done for us, it is that love that controls our behavior. Second Corinthians chapter 5. Because we have love, love controls your behavior. You put your trust in God and you love God in return. And because you love God, like I told you guys last week, my friend says very well, my, my, my friend Jola says very so poignantly, he says the truth is that the only person that we truly love is God. Every other person that we love is because we love God. So there's a way that the Holy Spirit pours the love of God in our hearts. He sheds it abroad that it fills us so much and it overflows to everybody around us. The reason why I love you, brothers and sisters, is because God loves you. I cannot say I love God and not love you. That's what John was lamenting about in the book of 1 John. Do you understand that? He was lamenting about it from 1 John chapter 2 to chapter 3 to chapter 4, as if he would not hear it again in chapter 5. It was like as if he was just repeating himself, repeating himself, repeating himself. It is because we love God so much that we love the people that God loves. So no man can say that he loves God or he knows God and not love his brothers and sisters. You cannot say you love God. You cannot say you have seen what God did for you and you love God in return and you will not care about people. You don't love God. And so even our behavior towards God, that's why, we, that's why God has given us a new nature. He has given us a new heart. Listen to me. If you don't have a new nature, you cannot love God. That command, thou shalt love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. That command is a command that only God can help someone to fulfill. You can't fulfill it by your own power. Because by the flesh, by the natural man, you love yourself. The flesh is hostile to God because it is always thinking of itself. The natural man is always thinking of himself. Even when the natural man is doing good because of revelation in common grace, that man is doing those good things because of himself. When a man has made billions and billions of naira, he now becomes a charitable person. This is someone that when he was trying to build his corporation from the ground, he did a lot of nasty things, did a lot of terrible things, misused his employees, misused them, overworked them to build. The company now became a billion dollar company. He now has hundreds of millions in the account. He does not know anything to do with the money. He now starts saying, I'm doing charity. I want to solve global warming. Even when the natural man is doing good, he's doing good because of himself. Because it feels right. That's why you hear some funny discussions on ethics by natural people on Twitter and everything. You say um, everything that um, everything we are doing is ultimately selfish because um, I, 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 I save people. If you see someone that is drowning, you are saving the person because it makes you feel bad, so it's still about you. That is, he's saying the right thing because he's a natural man. Even when the natural man is toasting a girl and he's um, you know, spending money on a girl and everything, this is the reason why even our ethics as Christians with respect to marriage and relationship is different from the world. When the natural man is toasting a girl, he's toasting a girl and cooking the girl for what the girl will do for him. Same thing with the girls too. When she's cooking for the guy and submitting to the guy and doing all those things for the guy, it's because of how much the guy can do for her. How he can provide for her, how he can protect her, how he can be there to comfort her and everything. But in Christianity, the primary reason why we do the things that we do is because of God, which overflows on the person. Is that what I'm saying to you? Yes. In the natural world, people objectify themselves. The guys, average guy looks at the girl as a walking sex mannequin. He's a mannequin with sheep that can just talk. If she can just shut up, he wouldn't mind. If she can shut up and just be there for his pleasure, he wouldn't mind. If he's the type that wants her to be talking, she should be saying the kind of thing that he wants. It's all about him, him, him. Objectification. Same thing with the ladies too. 
The guy is a walking ATM machine that has muscles. So it's hybrid of ATM and bodyguard. It's still objectification. It's still objectification. It's only the guys that have money they're going for. The, whatever, whatever the guy does, the kind of person he is, his value system doesn't matter. You're not even thinking about what is the plan of God for this person. If something happens and this person cannot do this thing, or there is a conflict between the person's ability to give me what I want and the person's ability to fulfill the purpose of God for his life, what will be my choice? They don't think about those things. They don't. Church, all together. So when the gospel enters our heart, it affects every area of our lives. It affects even the way we get attached to good things. And that's one point I want to make at this point, that we can become legalistic even about good things, things that are meant to be of worship. We can become legalistic about even good things that, that are meant to be things of worship. I was having a conversation with a sister during the week and everything. I was talking about someone who's going through and everything. So she reminds me of me using an example, right? I'm talking about prayer and we are expecting something and desiring something. I've been praying and praying and praying and praying and that thing has not come yet. And then you have that kind of experience that you begin to ask yourself a question. I begin to say, have I not prayed enough? Have I not done what I should do enough? Why has God not given me this thing I'm asking for? Is it because I have not prayed enough? Brothers and sisters, listen to me. The moment you, are ex- you desire something and your mind begins to do diagnostics, run diagnostics, and that is the answer that your mind is coming up with, that is it because I have not prayed enough, you have entered legalism already. Because whoever can ask the question, have I, um, whoever can believe that it's because they didn't pray enough that they didn't get certain things, if that thing comes into our li- their lives, they are, are, they are right to boast that it's because they prayed enough that they got those things. I'm happy you understood. <laughs> I was really worried I'll have to explain again. If before something happens, you are able to convince yourself that it's because you were not praying enough that that thing has not come. When that thing comes, you will have the right and the audacity to boast that it's because you prayed enough. Listen to me. There's nothing in your life that's because you prayed enough. Nothing. There's nothing in your life that you got because you prayed enough. That is the reason why the gospel, understanding the true gospel of Christ, affects even the way you pray. Your prayer is because you trust in God, not because you trust for things. Hey, the reason why you pray is because you trust in God. The God that loved you so much, that's why Paul says in Romans chapter 8, that how can he that gave us his son, not with him, freely give us all what? So the way you pray is not you are praying for things. You are praying, your faith is not for things. Your faith is in God. You are trusting in God. Such that when you are praying, and this, whatever it is, even if it's a good thing, and that thing is taking time, your response will not be, my, um, how can it be when the Holy Spirit tells us, um, when Paul tells us in Romans chapter 8, that we don't even know how we ought to pray as we should. But the Holy Spirit makes intercessions for us according to the will of God because he knows our weaknesses. That means that even on your best day, when you are praying six hours, you are praying rubbish. And it's not tongues he's talking about. That means because you can't see everything, it is your weakness. You can't see beyond your nose. It is your weakness. You don't, that thing you are praying for, you don't even know whether that thing is good for you. You don't know how to pray for it. You don't know when to pray. To, you don't know how to pray for that right thing to come at the right time. You don't know. Even your prayer, the Holy Spirit is helping you. Even your prayer, after you've prayed it, Imagine someone now bragging that it's because I prayed 12 hours and I opened the heavens. Are you a joker? You see, it's because you've not prayed like some of us that we have attained stature. Are you joking? <laughs> so that means that even our prayer, we are praying because our trust is in God. That we, the God that can give us himself and incarnate a body just to kill it for our sake. There is nothing that is good for me that I'm praying for that that God cannot give me. If he has not brought it, it's because in the management of this broken world, he knows what he's doing. I will persevere until he gives me. Or until he gives me something better. Do you understand what I'm saying now? So it's not that you say, I want this promotion, and you have confessed at the beginning of the year, you must come like this, come like and it doesn't come by June. You now start panicking. That's how you're saying my feet. There's no God. So tell you what I'm saying to you. 
The God that can freely give us all sin, his problem is not curing cancer. So if I have a relative that died out of cancer, it cannot be because he's not good. He has already demonstrated his love in the maximal way that love can be demonstrated. So it cannot be because he does not love me that he didn't cure this sickness. It cannot be. It must be that in his eternal wisdom and in the management of this broken world, this is acceptable at this time and we must go with it. Like we're saying um, on Wednesday, there are certain things that you don't even accuse your mentors of. There are certain things that you don't even accuse the people that you hold in high regard. You don't accuse them of it. When you see someone that you honor and respect, someone that is very wise and very wealthy and very powerful, when the person does something that you're not okay with, you don't accuse the person of fault, do you? You assume, even when the person lays demands on you, you assume that it must be you that has a problem. How can you not be accusing God of wrongdoing? How? God's will for us is good. Look at the story of Job. What was the most important thing for Job? The most important thing for Job was for his faith to be tried and for his life to be submitted to God. That was the most important thing. The most important thing for Job was not to have plenty of cows and plenty of camels and plenty of children. That was not the good. That was just a good. The good, the good for Job was that he knows God and he puts his faith in God. And so that's why when God in his sovereign wisdom allowed Satan to persecute Job, people, people, people of the world look at it like as if it was such a terrible thing. What kind of um, obscene bet did God play? Because they don't understand that the good is knowing God and enjoying God. And so when God used Satan's persecution to teach Job a lesson, and Job, having been confused, says, I, I've never God corrected him on his legalism. Look at the way it was in all those chapters, chapter 16, 13, 24, he said, well, I've done everything right. From my youth, I've been a guide of the king. Somebody accused him and said, you, if you are suffering, it's because all of them legalistic together. The friends were accusing Job, that's because you're a bad person. If you're not a bad person, bad things will happen to you. See, shut up your mouth. They're telling guys, shut up. He talk again. Job will tell them, shut up back. And then they will tell him, no, you shut up. <laughs> the friends were telling him, it's because you're a bad person. If you're not a bad person, bad things will not happen to you. It's because you think you are righteous. You don't know anything. You and God, there's a gap. Job will say, what are you talking about? Ha, me, I know that I'm a good person. He says, from when I've been young, I've been a guide of blind people. I've been given to the poor. How can this thing be happening to me? It is not possible. God say, Job, if I slap you. <laughs> if I give you backhand. God first used like three chapters. He first gives like two chapters. He said, I'm not even done. Get another two chapters. When he was done with Job, Job now said, God, I'm very sorry, sir. You are right. I'm saying rubbish, please. In fact, there's nobody like, you know what you are doing. And then, having come out of that, that man realizing who God is and knowing God better, that was the good for Job. Do you understand what I'm saying? <laughs> but in that moment of his suffering, nobody will be able to understand how it is possible that all these things can be happening for good. The reason why we can say that thing with confidence now for people like us is that God has demonstrated how much he loves us already. There's nothing happening in this world that can question it again. Stretch out together. So even in things that are good, like worship, we must not allow legalism to creep in. Even in good things, we must not have a performance-based mentality to any of God's things. And by performance based, I'm talking about the ability to earn or to deserve the grace of God. No, we must never allow that mentality to creep in. It comes naturally with being in this broken world. It comes naturally with the flesh, but we must always guard against it because it's a, it's a deep, deep issue. Hallelujah. The Lord will help us in Jesus' name. So let us finish the, the book this morning. Verse 1 says, Brothers, if any of you is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual, Restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Keep watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted. Bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. This is another thing. So when the gospel seeps into your heart very well, it changes you in some fundamental ways. One of the fundamental ways that the gospel changes your mentality is that the gospel makes you, understanding the gospel makes us humble and tender towards other people's feelings. 
because we know that we are all comrades in brokenness, we have a certain quality of gentleness to others in their weaknesses. Because you know that you are not a good person. It's God that made you, helped you to be justified. You know who you are by yourself, right? And the, the gospel makes you understand your fault and your weaknesses. When you see other people, you recognize that they are your comrade in brokenness. So it's all together. And because you recognize that people are your comrades in brokenness, it is because of that reason that you'll be very gentle and humble when people are falling. So it's all together. It makes us humble. It makes us tender towards other people's feelings. When someone falls into error, it's just people that are repentant, not unrepentant people. You understand what I'm saying now? Mm-hmm. Because unrepentance is the, 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 the trap of Satan. Amen? Do you hear what I just said now? Yeah. So now you say, because Satan is falling, so I have sympathy for Satan. Mm-hmm. Yet when you see believers that are failing and are repentant, when the righteous falls, because you also recognize your own failing, and you see it in a, some, in a, in a someone who has, who has weaknesses. It makes you tender towards other people's feelings. Legalism gives us this sense of superiority. It makes us nasty. It makes us wicked. That is the reason why, despite the fact that I'm the fan of my people, so, so, you guys know what I'm talking about, right? I'm the fan of certain people. Holiness Pentecostals, I'm their fan. We are guys, amen? But there's one plague that you will find there that everybody can attest to. is the for lack of a better word, the wickedness that comes with certain atmosphere. Very unempathetic. Very uncaring. No place for exemptions. No place for faults. Every fault, no matter how repentant you are, is dealt with so ruthlessly like I see it was. It's that sense of surprise. It's because, it's because you cannot identify with people's brokenness that you think that when people are doing things that you cannot do it, that you come very harsh on them. Nothing cures ruthlessness like recognizing that it can happen to you too. Nothing. I've been saying this. So if I use some examples now, remember the whole message. Don't just use this example now to think you are free to do rubbish. Because I want to use an example now. Something happens to a young lady and she falls into error in a, mom, in a low moment of not thinking. In a very, very bad moment and in a low moment, falls into error and gets pregnant out of wedlock. Of course, the person will be disciplined. Of course, the person will be made to know that what they have done is not right. But you will never treat the person as if the person has done one sin that is, the, the person should be destroyed for. Do you understand what I'm saying? There's a certain kind of wickedness you have to people when they have errors. That's because you think you are better than them. Of course, they'll be disciplined. In fact, discipline is restorative. We're looking towards them growing. We're not looking to kill them. But you will not feel that because you think it's... Let me give you an example. Real life example. There was a pastor in America. My, my, um, one of my mentors likes using an example a lot. His own legalism was on steroids. He was not even being biblical with his own legalism. His own law for divorce was, you know, all those um, fundamentalists. And he's always Baptist people. So, um, that was just a joke. Please, come in down. <laughs> that was just a joke. <laughs> Praise God. Let me just continue. So, this guy had this thing he used to say. He used to say that um, um, there is no grounds for divorce whatsoever. That even when Jesus said it, Jesus was saying that, um, can he, he just had his own explanation. So even First Corinthians 7 out of the window, there's no grounds for divorce whatsoever. No grounds. Nothing can ever happen. No grounds. When people divorce because of serious, because you know there's bad reason for divorce and there's biblical one. He said, no, no grounds. No grounds. No grounds. Everybody, is communication. You are gone. You are no more a Christian. If you divorce, you're not a born believer. It's communication. Get out. His daughter now grew up. And there was now a guy in the church, a son of one of the elders in the church who was secretly homosexual, practicing homosexual, but they did not know. He now toasted the girl and married the girl. After marriage, he now ran away. And ran away with his boyfriend. Now, as far as the Bible is concerned, First Corinthians chapter 7, that person is not born again, number one. Paul tells us that if, so, if you are married to someone that's a non-believer and the person wants to leave you, the person is allowed to leave, isn't it? Number two, that marriage was done under false pretenses. That knowledge is not. But the guy, the father, all his 30 years or 20 years in ministry, has been swearing for such people. You don't catch him now. What will happen? All of a sudden, empathy will come. Do you understand what I'm saying to you? Nothing makes you tender towards other people 
like realizing that you are comrades in brokenness. And that's why, look at something that he says. Verse 3, look at what he now says, verse 3. He says, for if anyone thinks he's something when he's nothing, he does what? He deceives himself. He now says, but let each one test his own work. Listen, listen. When you hear that someone is failing, when you hear that someone fell into error, someone fell into sin, your first response should not be, look at all these people. <laughs> your first response should be, God, ah, help me all. When you see a believer, a repentant believer, someone that loves God, fall into error, your first response should not be, oh my God. <laughs> your first response should be, ah, God, help me all. The first time I heard that one of the, the pastors one of these American pastors that had an issue with um, chatting with someone, it was inappropriate, and it's, you know, there was church discipline, and it was bench for a while and everything and all that. I remember the way I felt the first time I said, God, I beg. God, I beg, help me. God, help me. Let this thing not happen to me. You will now begin to appreciate the elders that never had issues. All of a sudden, Pastor Kumi's respect in your eyes will just become big. You just realize that, oh, more, this thing is not easy. Yo. You do ministry for over 50 years, not one scandal. Is grace. Church, I hear what I'm saying to you. All of a sudden, you, that's why Paul says, if anyone thinks he's something, when he is nothing, he deceives himself. That sense of you are better than other people, you are deceiving yourself. And that's why, that's another flip side of legalism is that there's a way it pushes people into terrible depression and sense of nihilism when they fall. Because eventually, such people now, they've deceived themselves for so long, deceived themselves, deceived themselves to believe that they are good, they can never fall. When they now fall, it's not be like as if they are going back into the world. Because it's not be like, how can this happen to me? Me of all people. Me of all people. How can this happen to me? Bro, you are sheep. Fall down before your Lord and collect any discipline they give you because you will actually collect. Fall down before the throne of grace and your elders and your church community. Let them discipline you and beg for mercy. Beg. Don't be for me that, um, how can this happen to me? Who are you? So that means that when we see each other in church and we see our, each other's faults, right? Our response to them is recognizing that even we ourselves are broken. So everything we are doing is restorative. That's why even discipline and chastisement is what? Restorative. You will not allow anybody to slip into a sense of what I'm doing is good. Listen, this is what I said. Understanding the gospel makes us people that first check ourselves when there is sin. But if you are always seeing other people's sin and not yours, you are legalistic. The gospel makes us very sensitive to our personal faults as we constantly appraise ourselves. Yet, we are ruthless to the sin in ourselves and in others. This makes us gentle but firm. It makes us understanding and yet uncompromising. Church, do you see that? So, because we recognize that, this is, this is what the gospel makes you recognize. The gospel makes you recognize that you are broken. Makes you, how, makes you recognize how evil your sin is. Um, evil your sin is. And yet, because of that same gospel, you recognize how evil sin is. Because if evil was a small thing, if sin was a small thing, God would not incarnate to die for it. It will be overkill. But sin is such a terrible thing that it required the God of heaven to come and die for us. That means sin is very bad. So when you recognize how bad sin is and you recognize how broken you are, what will be your response? You will be uncompromising and yet gentle. Do you see that? You will be ruthless and yet just. You will be gentle and yet firm. You will be understanding and yet uncompromising. Look at what Paul tells us about love in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Let's quickly check 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Look at two things that Paul says about love that seems almost paradoxical, but it is not paradoxical. Look at verse 4. He says, love is patient. Love is what? Kind. So love is patient. Love is kind. You see that verse 4, verse 5 says it is not rude. But then you go to verse 6 and says, it does not rejoice at what? But always rejoices in the what? So love is gentle. Love is not wicked. Yet at the same time, love does not smile with rubbish. The world and the natural man can't understand how the two are not contra co co um, contradictory, but they are not. 
Anybody who is wise and a parent can understand what it means to be with your child, to be tender and yet uncompromising. That is the way we are also with our brothers and sisters in Christ. In, in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 15, Paul talks about speaking the truth in what? Love. Ephesians 4, 15. That means that you can tell people the truth with love. So shall we together? If a child, if you put a cup, a cup of poison, if there's a cup of poison on a chair and a child is crawling towards the poison and all that, what it looks like to love the child is not to say, oh honey, don't touch it. It's not good for you. When the child is about to drink it, what do you do? You slap it first. Then, first the child. A child of someone has forgotten themselves and they're walking on the road and an unmoving vehicle is coming. What do you do? You will snatch the child and get out of the way. <laughs> there was this teacher I had a secondary school. I don't know how true it is. Maybe you guys can confirm if it is true or not. There was a teacher secondary school. He was born in South South Africa. I think it was from Bonny by us and everything. And he was telling us an analogy that in their village, that if somebody is drowning, that the way they used to save such people is that they would jump into the river and first slap the person. Or to make the person unconscious, because if the person is awake and the person is trash, and the person can drag you down to, to the river and drown both of you. So you first put the person, make you calm down. <laughs> drag the person. Those of you from South South, I don't know how true it is. <laughs> but I can never forget that analogy. <laughs> Praise God. Praise Jesus. So verse 4 now says, But let each one test his own work, and then, when he's, and then his reason to boast will be in himself alone, and not in his neighbor, for each one will have to bear his own load. So we lighten each other's burdens by supporting them in their weakness. And then Paul now moves on to something connected, is that so, because we have a sense of camaraderie with people, we don't have a sense of superiority over them. So that means that in Christianity, we do not have our sense of satisfaction and achievement relative to other people. Our boast and pride is not at the expense of other people. It is at our own expense. So that means that when people are having issues, that is not where your joy and pride of accomplishment comes. You can't sound like the Pharisees and say, Lord, I'm not like all these people. They are sinners and everything. Me, I'm pure. That's, that's legalism. A Christian cannot do that. So that means that if you want to have... The, so there's a joy of progress. There's a joy of development. There is a joy of success that everybody should have. If we are not allowed to have it at the expense of other people, where do we have it from? Just have a question I just asked now. Look at what Paul says. Let's read it again. Verse 4. He says, but let each one test his own work, and then his reason to boast will be in himself alone and not in his neighbor, for each will bear his own load. Paul is saying something very striking and very important here. In life, generally, the way we know we have succeeded is when you look at other people. You understand that? I'm talking, let's talk naturally first now before I now talk biblically. Naturally, the way you know that you have succeeded, that you have made it in life, is when you look at other people that have not made it, isn't it? If, <laughs> if you think you've made it, but everybody has made it like you, have you made it? Don't lie. Naturally speaking, imagine you go to school and everybody has first class. Say first class, Nye. <laughs> well, 40 of you enter the class, 40 of you had first class. Is that one first class? If everybody got like third class from two, one, you are doing one and a half first, then they will give testimony. You say, I want to praise the Lord. Because all out of 100 people in our class, I'm the only one that came out with first class. Praise the Lord. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying now? If everybody is driving the same car, I mean, what's special about it? Nothing. If all of us are using the same phone, nothing. That's why natural man, the natural man desires to have the joy of progress and joy of success at the expense of another person. But in Christianity, it's not so. Because the person that you're having the joy at his expense is someone that is broken like you. Everything you have in your life is a gift. So you cannot look at someone and say, I'm better than you. Do you understand that now? So, but in, in life, you need something to orient yourself around. Christianity is not asking us to become ascetics, where we mute all our desires, as if you don't have anything that you are using to know that have succeeded. How do you know I've succeeded? How do I know I'm making progress? Paul says it is on your own. 
That means you test your own work and you carry your own load. So that means that the person you are competing against is not another person. You are competing against yourself. And so that means what that looks like is this, that for each and every one of us, God has a calling on your life. God has put something ahead of you. Spiritually, it is called the stature and the nature of Christ. It is called um, growing to the stature of Christ. In terms of your other, the, your other affairs in this world that God is giving you to think, God, God is giving you to do, you are working towards doing the will of God in that affairs, right? So there was a you of yesterday, and there's a you of tomorrow that is continually growing to that nature. Who are you competing against? Yourself. That means you evaluate yourself, you are competing, you are assessing your growth and success by where you are coming from and where you are going to. Church, are we together? So how do you know that I'm doing well? It's not by looking at another person's Okada because you are driving Camry. How do you know you are doing well? Is that what has God called me to do? What am I meant to do with my life? Am I the same place I was last year? That's how you know you are growing. That's how you know you are succeeding. If you want to go the route of getting your personal joy of success and progress by comparing yourself with other people, you will die in depression. Because for every material thing or for whatever thing you are trying to use to compete, compare yourself with another person, there's always another person beside you that looks better than you. So as you are having joy at the expense of one person, you are going to be having depression at the expense of, uh, 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 because of another person. As you are rejoicing over another person's, one person's Okada, you'll be rejoiced, you'll be sad over another person's Range Rover. And now, even if you're not the one that has the biggest Range Rover in the world, or let's just say, because after Range Rover, there's still uh, Homer, even that like cars, you understand what I'm saying? Then even if all the cars finish, there's now jets. Then even if all the jets finish, there's now even space rockets to go to the moon. Even if all those ones finish and you're like, Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk, that what, where you are now is that it's not even just as your problem again. Is that you're now building rockets to space. You will look at somebody that has a family, that his children are saying, oh, daddy, and then you'll be depressed. <laughs> because there's none of us in this broken world that has everything, everything. You, there will always be someone, you, you will now become a billionaire finish, and then you look at a poor man, and you now start feeling miserable. Because that one will now have something that you don't have. If you want to get joy at the expense of another person, you will die in what? The only thing that you do, you see, you don't need to go to motivational teachers to be telling you aspire to perspire to conquer and will be fire. <laughs> Read the word of God and let it fill your heart. The way you know you have made progress, no matter what you are going through now, I've been somewhere, but I don't have money. I'm seeing people that have money around me. Brothers and sisters, don't compare yourself to other people. Ask yourself, where am I compared to where I'm going and where I'm coming from? What is the will of God for my life? Because God has different plans for you. You, you are going the route of... These are just examples, right? If, you exa if this example taught you, I promise you it's not because of you. <laughs> You are going the route of doing your postgraduate or you are going to seminary or doing something that does not allow you to have plenty of money like some of your guys are still having plenty of money. There's nothing wrong with that. The question is, where was I yes, last year? Last year, I did not even know what I was doing. Last year, I was lost. Now, I am, I am getting this degree. Now, I am doing this. You look at God's plan for your life and how you are making progress and where you are coming from. That is when you will find out that your joy will always be sweet and nothing will corrupt it. So I tell you what I'm saying to you. You don't look at other people to get your sense of achievement. You look at God's plan for you. Paul restates this idea in 2 Corinthians chapter 10. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, from verse 12. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, from verse 12, says, Not that we dare to classify or compare ourselves with some of those who are commending themselves, when they measure themselves by one another and compare themselves by one another, they are without understanding. So you see, there are these guys, all those people that were troubling Paul and these super apostles, they were comparing themselves with, you know, um, with one another. So this is what, what Paul says, the way he says, he says, but they measure themselves, let me start from the beginning, he says, not that we just to classify or compare ourselves with some, some of those who are commending themselves. So these people were doing two things. There were some that were looking at themselves and praising themselves. There were, there were some that were commending themselves by comparing themselves with one another. Paul says that they do it without understanding. 
Verse 13, he now says, But we will not boast beyond limits, but we'll boast only with regard to the area of influence God has assigned to us to reach even to you. So these super apostles people were feeling like as if we've preached the gospel, because even then, Paul also alludes to it in Philippians chapter 1. So people were preaching the gospel. In the first century, a lot of people came out from Jerusalem and they were going around preaching the gospel, preaching the gospel, preaching the gospel. In that preaching the gospel, some people were doing it as competition. So some people will say, if you, read, if you read Romans chapter 16, Paul talks about this also. He says that I'm not even going to come and meet you guys again since I've already preached to, in all these areas. Rather, I will go to Spain and maybe come back to you guys or something like that. There's a book that were like, ah, <laughs> Jesus has risen. We go preach. And they will know us as apostles. So they were now looking for new places that nobody has preached. You know nowadays that people don't even want to preach the gospel. In the first century, they were using it as competition. First to get to Spain, we preach. And they will know that this is the apostle that preached to Spain. First, and that's why within 100 years, they had reached India. Go and check it on the map. That's what's happening. So what they were doing, that these guys were now comparing themselves and now saying, ah, we are bad guys. See what we have done. See what we have achieved. And they're comparing other people's territories. They say, where have you preached? We have preached in this place. You, you have preached only in, in two countries. Ugh. <laughs> we have preached in five countries. The thing sounds familiar, Abby. <laughs> Let's go on. But verse 13, what the Paul now says, he now says, but we will not boast beyond limits, but we will boast only with regard to the area of what that God has done what? To reach even. So that means that we boast. Your comparison is in what God has asked you to do. Let every man take joy in his own load. What is God's plan for your life? God has assigned to you that you're going to be a doctor. You are looking at your friend from secondary school or from UI that became a... Um, a a programmer that is now working for Microsoft and is now earning in dollars. And you, you're a doctor. You're collecting your uh, kidney and they're still maltreating you on top. You're not saying, <laughs> not saying what, what is wrong with me? This guy, you never know book in school. <laughs> Depression will just kill you. Depression will just kill you. We use this example, Taya. Let this example sink in. The master called them one day. And according to his plan for them, he gave one five talents, another one two, another one. If you want to, if you want to look at other people, depression will just kill you. If they give you five talents, you judge yourself by how many talents you brought back, which is what? Five. If they give you two, you don't judge yourself by the two you brought back. You judge it by what was given to you. Because if you want to judge it by the one that was given five talents, even your extra two no reach the one where they gave them initially. Did you hear what I just said now? Yeah. Because the two they gave you, the two you made on top, you not reach the five talents that they gave the one initially. If you want to walk to reach his ten talents, you walk till you die. When the master comes, what he will ask for you is, what have I given you? And what did you do with it? So the way you judge yourself is, God, what have you given me? And what am I doing with it? Not what are other people doing. What have you given me? This is contentment. That's why contentment is not laziness, neither is it greed. It is based on what God has given you. Look at verse 14. It says, For we are not extending, for we are not overextending ourselves as though we did not reach you, for we we're the first to come to you all the, all the way to you with the gospel of Christ. We do not boast beyond the limits in the labors of others. So you see that we don't boast beyond limits in the labors of others, but our hope is that as your faith increases, our area of influence among you may be greatly enlarged. So that we may preach the gospel in lands beyond you without boasting of work already done in other areas of influence. Let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. For it is, the, it is not the one who commends himself who is approved, but the one whom the Lord... Do you see that? The Lord will commend you based on what he has given you. So that means if you are boasting, you are boasting in the Lord. What in this context, what Paul is using this context, in this context, what is using that scripture to say is that your boast is in the Lord. What has the Lord given you? So you boast in what you have done. That is the righteous boast. There's ungodly boast and there's righteous boast. There's godly pride. Like where we're coming from, when Paul says that, you know, don't he should, then let it one test his own work and, um, and then his reason will, will boast in himself alone and not his neighbor for each one will be his own load. That's what he was talking about. There's godly boasting and godly pride. Not over or believing yourself higher than you. We're talking about having a sense of joy in what you have accomplished. Everybody, every human being, it is the gift of God that you have a sense of accomplishment. You're not supposed to live your life in this world having a sense of meaninglessness like I have not done anything in my life. I have not achieved anything. All of us know that when you have that feeling like my life is 
pointless. I'm not doing anything with my life. We know how depressing that feeling is. God did not design you to have that depressing feeling of, I've not done anything with my life. No. God wants you to have a sense of accomplishment. But the right way to have that sense of accomplishment is not at another person's expense. Your boast is in the Lord. It is the Lord that commands. And the Lord will commend you based on what he has given you to do. Brothers, let the word of God cure you of ungodly depression. In our generation, there's all causes of all kinds of things, all kinds of causes of depression. Let this one be removed from all the possible causes. Let's remove this one. Ask yourself, what has God called me to do? Let everybody carry their own load. In Christianity, there's an individuality to our, to our work. Let everybody carry his own load. It's your own load you used to judge. That is why you're, even your own temptations, you cannot use your temptations to look at another person as superior. Everybody carry your own load. That's why you can't compete with another person. A pastor cannot look at another congregation that has 10,000 people. That is his own five talents. And I hope he's using it well. If you like me, you know it's, it's between him and God. The one that God has given me, where was I yesterday? Where were my people yesterday? How were they? Church, are we together? How were they? How are they now? That is where the joy comes from. That we are serving God. We are doing more for God. Hallelujah. Church, are we together? Verse 6 now says, Let the one who is taught the word, <laughs> uh, let the one who is taught the word share all good things with the one who teaches. Amen? Amen. You are getting quiet now. <laughs> it says, Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever one sows, that he will also what? Reap. For the one who sows to his flesh will from the flesh reap corruption, and the one who sows to the spirit will from the spirit reap eternal life. Let us not grow weary of doing good. In due season we will reap if we do not give up. So then, as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone and especially to those who have the household of faith. So there's a holiness way of taking this scripture out of context. Because you know if you grew up in faith circles and all that, you know they do a lot of taking scripture out of context. Just take a scripture, just use it for what you like. It's the way we take verse, verse 8, verse 7 and 8. We say, do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever one sows, that will he also reap. For the one who sows to the flesh, will well, the flesh reap corruption. But the one who sows to the spirit, from well, the spirit reap eternal life. And so we see that the, as a scripture to talk about give fruit of the spirit and say, if you are doing sinful things, you will reap corruption. And if you are doing spiritual things, you will reap life. And it's actually correct. Well, that is actually in context, that is secondary. That is an application of the text. What the text actually means, what the text actually means is this. You read from verse 6 to the verse 10, very well, you see. It says, let the one who is taught in the world share all good things with the one who teaches. Do not be deceived. It now says, whatever you sow, you reap. The last line now says, let us not grow weary in what? Doing good. For in due season we will reap if we do not give. So you're now describing the good we are doing. Verse 10 now says, so then, as we have opportunity to do good, as, as, as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone, and especially of those who are in a household of... Do you see the context now? Paul is saying something. And what he's saying in context is that, see, there is sowing and reaping. And that sowing and reaping, what it looks like is this. Whatever you value, you give attention to. Whatever you value, you give attention to, and you also give resources to. And it's because you value those things that you're giving your resources to those things. And as you are giving resources and giving attention and value to those things, those things will yield to you. And so that means that if you, if you value your flesh and your carnal desires, and you are constantly giving attention and giving resources and giving attention towards things that just satisfy your carnal desires, what you are going to be reaping, what you'll be seeing more of in your life is death and corruption. You'll be seeing privation. But if you give attention to spiritual things, and because you give attention to spiritual things, you will give attention to the one that is teaching, isn't it? Isn't it? You will give attention to those who are your household of faith. In giving attention to these things, you will reap eternal life. So all the things that pertain to the life of God, all the things that pertain to the workings of God among the believers, all the things that pertain to the life of God, you are going to see more and more and more and more of it in your life. That's what he's saying. What you value, you give attention to. And what you give attention to, you give your resources to. So I get what I'm saying to you. If you value spiritual things, your life will become more spiritual. You will reap of it. 
If you give attention, if you give attention to the word, if you if you hold the word of God in high esteem and you give much attention to it, your life will abound in eternal life. What that means is that you will grow in sanctification. Because again, you know, we, we talk about it very much. Let me just say it again that there are certain words that the, that the apostles use to qualify the salvation that we receive, the salvation that is ongoing, and the salvation that is coming. So you see certain scriptures, Paul talks about how we receive eternal life. Here, Paul is talking about reaping eternal life. And Paul talks about in, in hope of eternal life that we will still get. All this thing is him still saying, we were saved, we are being saved, and we will be what? Saved. It's another way of saying it is that we're justified, we're regenerated, we are being sanctified, and we will be what? Glorified. It's the same thing he's saying in different ways. So in, there's an earthly walk whereby we reap the fruits of the life of God, where we grow in sanctification, where we see more of the things of God in our life, where we abound in activities and gifts of God, where we, where we do more for God, where we grow in wisdom, where all the things that pertain to the will of God for our lives, we see more of it. That's what it means to reap eternal life. If you pay attention to spiritual things, you will reap. The more attention you give to spiritual things, the more you will reap in your life. So shall we together? If you pay attention to carnal things, the more death you will reap. If you watch movies a lot at the expense of your work, your work will suffer. That is corruption. These are just simple examples that will help you. If you pay so much attention to sexual satisfaction because you are not married, you will reap emotional turmoil, psychological problems. Apart from the fact that God will judge you. That's aside. We're talking about what you even reap now. Because in judgment, there are two parts. There is the... Um, effective judgment that comes as a result of consequences, and then there's the intentional judgment of God to bring judgment on a person. Now, in context, we're talking about what you reap, the things that come naturally. If you pay attention to your image too much and you're doing things for the sake of your image, you will put yourself in depression. Whenever you sow to the flesh and you are giving to the flesh, you are doing things that appeals to your flesh, the things that will keep coming back to you are things of death and corruption. When you eat and eat and eat and eat and eat too much, because that is what you are giving your attention to, you will reap obesity and sickness from it. When you rest and rest and rest too much instead of you to work, you will reap incompetence and lack of work and poverty from it. Those are just common examples. But even more spiritually, if you give attention to carnal things at the excess of spiritual things, you will reap. You will not know God's word. The temptations that should not be blowing you about will be stressing your life. Things that should make you strong, where you can stand, where you're supposed to stand and overcome some things, you won't be able to because you are weak. But when you sow to the Spirit, you will be strong. You will reap eternal life. Your Christian work and your sanctification will be stronger. A lot of things that are happening, even relationship. When you sow to the flesh, you will reap corruption in relationship. That means if you are making decisions based on the flesh in relationship, you will reap what? Corruption. You are marrying someone because she has shape. You are sowing to the flesh. What will you reap? You are dating a guy because, just because he has money. You are sowing to the flesh. What will you what? Ah, they don't want to talk again. <laughs> when you are making a decision about the person, the person that you marry, you sow to the spirit. What are you talking about? You are looking at spiritual things. Your most important things are the values. What are the spiritual things there? What kind of values does the person have? What kind of hope does the person have? Does the person know the love of God? Can, can the person truly love? Is the person wise? Is the person honest? Does he have integrity? Does she have integrity? Can she love? Does she know how to truly love? Does he know how to truly love? Those are the things you look first. If you are so into physical things, the flesh, and how you feel, you reap corruption. Anything your eyes see, you collect. Do you know what I'm saying to you? Aha. And so it is in that context that Paul now says, it is because you have so much value for the word of God that one, you give to, um, those who teach the word or those who are taught the word must share with those who teach. It is, it is that sense of value that helps you share with them. Church, are we together? It is not out of compulsion. It is not out of manipulation. It is out of the sense of what? Value. Church out together. Because there are two extremes on it. They are the extreme of those that manipulate and expect to and expect that even though you don't have value for God's word, you've never prayed in your life, this person is not actually growing your sanctification. 
But the person has positioned themselves as an idol. And the person just wants you to have value for them. Because don't forget what we are talking about here. It's because of the value that you have for spiritual things. And so that means the value that you have for the person is based on the fact that the person is sowing to the spirit and teaching the word. Do you understand that? Not just because the person is the head of a cult. Or just because the person is charismatic. You are not sowing to the person because the person is charismatic. You are not sowing to the person because if you sow to the person, an anointing will flow in your direction. Why are you doing it? Because of the sense of value. You are sowing to the spirit. Your attention is on the value the person is bringing to your life. So there's one extreme of those who are manipulating people and getting money out of people, not because they are, those people are of the spirit, but because of all the other carnal things. Their charisma and the cult following and manipulating people to give. And there's also the excess of people that don't put value on those who are laboring in the things of the spirit. And because of that, they, because they don't put value in there, they don't share with such people. What the gospel teaches is that if, you have, if the word has been blessing you, if you've been growing in sanctification, if you've been reaping eternal life in a place or through someone's ministry, you ought to share your resources with the person. It's Paul that said it. It's not Shea that said it. Church, I hear what I'm saying to you. It didn't stop there. He now went to verse 9 and now says, Let us not grow weary of doing good, for in due season we will reap if we do not give up. So then, as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone, as well to those of the household. So doing good is actually giving to God's people. So because you value the house, you value the word, you value God's body, you value those that are laboring in word, but you also value your brothers and sisters. So that means that one of the ways that you know that there's a distortion in a local church's practice of giving is that if that giving is only... Praise God. There's only one me in this church. <laughs> if there's something supernatural happen, please put your phones on silence. And don't, don't play this in your service, right? So here's how you can know there's a distortion in the, in the, in the local church's um, culture of gospel giving. This is gospel giving. Is that when the giving is only in one direction. Do you understand that? That's how you know there's a distortion. One error is to have giving in only one direction. One error is that you're not giving in any direction, in that direction at all. Another, uh, just like I said, so how you know the biblical way of giving is that the giving is going in the direction of the ones that are teaching and also in the direction of all the brothers and sisters who are in need. Church, do you understand that? I get what I'm saying to you. That's why um, the council talked about the Samaritan fund yesterday. That is biblical giving. Because you have, look at what um, the Lord said. The Lord said it first. Mark chapter 4. Look at what the Lord said in Mark chapter 4. Verse 24. Look at the way the Lord said it in Mark 24, verse 24. The Lord says, and he said to them, and this was after he told them the parable of the seed and all that. Look at the way he ended it. In verse 24, Mark chapter 4, he says, and he said to them, pay attention to what you hear. With the measure you use, it will be measured to you, and still more will be added to you. For to the one who has more, who has, more will be given, and from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken Wait, so the Lord was saying something here. That the, be careful how you are paying attention. The more attention you give to something, the more that will be a measure to you. So the Lord tells you, you reap when you give attention to something. When you give value to something, when you have a sense of value for something, you reap of it. That's why even in your different careers, you notice that when you pay more attention, um, the people in the world, Marco Gadot said it, he says 10,000 hours. And we have different ways of saying it and typifying it. Basically, it's still the same idea. That if you give attention to something, that thing will yield to you. If you pay attention to your wife, your wife will yield to you. Amen? I said it in the in most Christian way that marriage people can understand. Mm-hmm. If you're single, just don't worry about what I said. But that's it. If you pay attention to your spouse, it will yield to you. If you pay attention to your children, it will what? Yield. But same also with spiritual things. You pay attention to spiritual things, it will yield. And so that's what Apostle Paul was saying also. That if you pay attention to, the, to, to God's people, you love God's people, to the things of the Spirit, it is actually doing good. And you should not be weary in doing good. We keep doing good. Of course, this scripture also applies in not just in giving and paying attention to the local church, but even in all kinds of good. In every area of good. The Bible, if you keep doing good, it will, don't get tired. In due time, you will what? Reap. Church out together. Praise God. Hallelujah. 
So verse 11 now says, See with what large letters I am writing to you with my own hand. It is those who want to make a good showing in the flesh who would force you to be circumcised, and only in order that they may not be persecuted for the cross of Christ. For even those who are circumcised do not themselves keep the law, but they desire to have you circumcised that they may boast in your flesh. Paul says something, like where we started from. Some people want to make you try to earn your righteousness. They make you try to earn the gift of God by putting a burden on you and be claiming that you must do certain things to earn the gift of God. He says those people, they, they themselves don't even obey the laws. They are lying. <laughs> Praise God. They are lying. I was telling you how legalism makes us liars. They are lying. Whenever you see people that are always talking about what they did to attain their stature, they, there's lies. There's lies. That's how, you know, you, you saw the one that trended in the last week. Lies. He said, men of stature, they have to absorb the power. Can you call it? Lies. <laughs> lies. When you see people already claiming that they did something to achieve where they are, look at the way Paul says it. Verse 13. For even those who are circumcised do not themselves keep the law. You know what I'm saying? If you don't pray five hours every day, you are not kidding. It's a lie. I've told, I've told you guys before. It's a lie. The people that are putting burdens on you that if you don't do this, you cannot break it to certain levels. They themselves are not doing it. It's a lie. It's a lie. Why are they doing it? They just want to hold power over you. They want to exhaust themselves at your expense. They want to make idols of themselves so that you can look up to them. It's all lies. Everything you have is the grace of God. Let God be true. Let every man be a what? Liar. Hallelujah. So verse 14 now says, But far be it from me to boast, except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. For neither circumcision counts for anything, nor uncircumcision, but a new creation. You see that? Very beautiful. He says, I'm not going to boast about what I did to achieve what I did. No, I've died to that lifestyle. I'm only going to boast in what Jesus did for me, that Jesus loved me and gave me everything that I have. So neither circumcision nor uncircumcision has any value. Works have no value in earning righteousness. They only have value in demonstrating the righteousness that was imparted to us. Hallelujah. Works of the law, they have no value in earning righteousness, in deserving righteousness. Our works are purely a manifestation and demonstration of the righteousness that we have received, which was a what? Gift. Which was imparted to us, which was a gift. We cannot earn the goodness of God, but we can appreciate the goodness of God. Did you hear what I just said? We cannot earn the goodness of God, but we can and we must appreciate the goodness of God. Our works cannot earn the righteousness of God, but our works must manifest the righteousness that we receive. Our works cannot earn the righteousness of God, but our works must manifest the righteousness that we have what? Received. And Paul now ends by saying, from now on, let no one cause me trouble. For my bear on my body the marks of Jesus. Paul ends everything by restating his apostleship. He says, I have the right to talk to you. And nobody should question my ministry. Because of my body. Not, you know what we started from in chapter 1 and the first early part of chapter 2. That not only did God call me. God called me and gave me a special calling that human beings would not validate. All they could do was to confirm that it was true, that they received the same things. So it was God that called me. He now ended it with another level of his authority as the apostle. That not only did God call me as a holy apostle, as a foundation of the church, I have suffered for this gospel. I have the marks on my body. I have been last 39 times plus one, multiple times. I have been thrown to lions. I have been dragged on the streets of, 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 of the streets of cities for the sake of the gospel. I have the marks of defending this gospel on my back. Let no man trouble me. <laughs> so a video during the week. Allow me, please. Because we're in the context, you must preach to what's happening around you. One guy was wearing Gucci suits, cream suits. He said, um, how can you be celebrities when we are persecuted? He said, no, we are persecuted. I was like, persecuted, K. There's no mark on your body, sir. I will trouble you. <laughs> Me, I will trouble you. There's no mark on your body. <laughs> yes, I will trouble you. 
<laughs> you are wearing Gucci suits with like 10 bodyguards around you, protecting you. Which mark? How did the mark touch you? From 10 bodyguards? <laughs> Paul says, not only did God call me, I suffered for this thing. I have the right to tell you people. I nearly died because of preaching. I can tell you. I defended this thing with my life. If it, was, if it was not true, I wouldn't defend it with my life. So I can tell you the truth. Don't trouble me. Listen to what I'm telling you. That's the pride that the pastor can have. You see, I've suffered for you. I've not collected like someone in the Bible. God will give me that testimony. That's what my name is Samuel. Amen. Praise God. <laughs> the people that gave me the name are in church. We'll talk about them later. Praise God. Right? So see, come and say... Have I collected anything from anybody? If anybody can see I've taken their donkey or their sheep, come out. Nobody. Can't. It gives you authority to tell people the truth. You understand what I'm saying now? Yeah. That's the beauty of not being able to you can tell people, I've suffered for this thing. I have not collected anything from you. Is there any one of you that can accuse me of anything? No. Therefore, listen to me. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Amen. Hallelujah. This is the grace of our Lord. We must not lose sight of it. We must not forget it. We must not lose sight of it. We must not forget it. Let's bow our heads and let's pray. He's worthy of our worship. He alone. Every other man in our life is his creature. Every other person you know, every powerful person you know in your life is a creature of God. That person will die and pass. But he's eternal. He's worthy of our worship. He's worthy of our worship. The one worthy of all our adoration. The adorable one, the beautiful one, the perfect one. The beautiful one, the perfect one, the good one. You are worthy of my worship. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for calling me somebody. Thank you for calling me somebody. Thank you for making something of my life. Thank you for giving me something. Thank you for creating me. Thank you for the privilege of, a, of existence, of thriving, of doing things. Thank you for making me. Thank you for the hope of glory. Thank you because I know death will not be my end. Thank you for the hope of glory. Thank you because I know everything will be okay one day. Everything will be beautiful eventually. Everything will be perfect eventually. You are worthy of worship. Not just because you are higher than me. You have been good to me. You have loved me. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. You are worthy of my worship. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name, we have prayed. The same men, as we pray this psalm, will the Lord answer you in the day of trouble. Amen. May the name of the God of Jacob protect you. Amen. May he send you help from the sanctuary and give you support from Zion. Amen. May he remember all your offerings Amen. and regard with favor all your sacrifices. Amen. May he grant you your heart's desires. Amen. May he fulfill all your plans. Amen. May we shout for joy over your salvation. Amen. And in the name of our God, set up our banners. Amen. May the Lord fulfill all your petitions. Amen. Some people may trust in chariots. Some may trust in horses. Some may trust in their power. Some may trust in their connections. Some may trust in their gifts. Some may trust in their own ability. But we will trust in the name of our God. Amen. We will trust in Jesus who gave himself and died for us. Amen. Thank you, Father in heaven. In Jesus' name we have prayed.